Today on Applied Science, I'd like to show you this interesting technique that I came up with. We have here an orange plasma display panel from the 90s and a cheap 405 nanometer laser pointer from eBay. And if I just take the laser pointer and draw on the display, <laughs> it actually works like a little Etch-a-Sketch where when the laser pointer hits the display, we get a permanent thing of light coming out. Now the display is being run at a lower voltage than it normally is, so it's kind of like half or quarter brightness. And then when the laser pointer hits it, it goes to full brightness. And the best part about this is if we cycle the power, the thing goes away. So it really is like an Etch-a-Sketch and you can, you know, draw something else on there. And it's really very uh, consistent and reliable and it's this really cool technique. Now, originally I thought, oh, this is a classic case of UV photoelectric effect, you know, exciting the, um, you know, ejecting electrons from the electrodes that are in there and, and there you go. But actually, as we'll see, this is quite a bit more interesting and complicated than that. And you're in for a couple of interesting aha moments if you like uh, semiconductors and solid state physics. Um, start thinking about devices that can change state even when the power is off. So now I've got the power turned off and if I scribble on the display and then turn it on, <laughs> the pattern also appears, at least temporarily. So that's rather strange. Uh, I don't think it can be just a plain photoelectric effect if the pattern can remain even when the power is off. So in the first part of the video, we're just gonna play around with this for a few minutes and try out a bunch of different things. And then I'll try to explain what's going on in there, but keep in mind there will be a fair bit of conjecture here because this is kind of a weird topic and you're not likely to find stuff on the internet about lasers activating plasma displays as a weird kind of input-output device. So I mentioned weird input-output, and we know this thing can work like a light pen, but what else can we do with it? I thought, well, wouldn't it be funny to have like a transparency or even a 35 millimeter film negative and see how that works out? All right, let's see what we got there. Not bad, not bad at all. Um, as you'll see, only half of the pixels or three quarters of the pixels are running, but it's still more than enough resolution to capture an image like that. And uh, you know, it leads to the question, can we use this thing as a readout? Could we actually put a drive circuit that could both display an image and read in something, read in you know, light pen you know, information from the user and read in images from the user that you could scan? It's this weird kind of not perhaps useful, but very definitely futuristic display that's kind of a scanner, a camera, a light input device, and a display all at the same time. Here's another interesting idea. I've got a polarization filter in front of the laser to reduce the intensity. And so now if I go over it quickly with the laser pointer, nothing happens. But if you slow down and let it kind of sink in, you get this sort of ink blot effect where it behaves almost like a real pen where it kind of the ink soaks into the paper. So for artists, it has sort of like this time component where if you go over a spot quickly, you know, nothing happens. But if you're slow and you kind of let it build up, you can kind of paint with it. It has a very weird feeling to it. Like it's a time component, but it also saturates where you can see it's not really getting as bright as it was with um, the unfiltered laser. And I don't think the polarization has anything to do with this because I've played with that pretty extensively. It's really just the intensity thing. So I did mention this works with floodlights too, not just lasers, it's just a lot slower. And so I've got my uh, multi-spectral LED board from uh, last video, and I've currently got it set to 405 nanometer. Now this has almost no effect. You can sit over this for a long time with the LED at 405 nanometer, and it just doesn't have enough power to do anything. But we'll make this a little bit more interesting. We'll put two pieces of plastic on here that look about the same, and I'm going to set my LED box to 365, which is going to have a big effect. In fact, you can tell already that the two um, halves are behaving differently. Now, so far, uh, there's no permanent effect. Like it does actually increase the light output by quite a bit in through one piece of plastic, but not the other, and certainly without either piece of plastic, but nothing is holding permanently. But if we get in really close and give it a really good dose for about maybe 10 or 20 seconds each, Okay, so let's see what we got here. 
<laughs> as you can see, so one of these, I think this is the polymethyl methacrylate or acrylic, and it passes the ultraviolet more willingly, or at least 365 nanometer light, uh, than the polycarbonate, which blocks a lot of the 365. And so you end up with this pattern here. And you can see between the two pieces of plastic, it was even brighter because uh, this, even the acrylic, does block some amount of UV. So this does drive home the fact that this thing is very wavelength sensitive. Um, even though the laser pointer is specced to be 405, they aren't perfectly narrow, and so there is some amount of 365 nanometer light coming out of here. And it's just so intense that even though, um, you know, the, it's a long tail, but it, the peak was very high, so the tail still has quite a bit in it too. For this demo, I'm gonna swing the laser pointer very quickly by, and as you can see, it's dotted. Let's see if I can go even faster. And that's cool. Now, as it turns out, we're powering this display with alternating current, and the frequency of the current is about 1700 hertz. And yes, the pitch of the dots matches the frequency of the drive. So this is cool. So, uh, you know, it kind of makes sense when the voltage is near its peak, we get this effect happening where the ultraviolet hits the panel and we get this persistence. And when the AC cycle is near zero, then we don't get this effect and it's dark there. But an even more interesting piece of information is that the pattern has this ostinato to it, where it's sort of like big dot, small dot, big dot, small dot. And that is a very interesting thing that tells you there's some kind of an asymmetry going on here. Even though we may not know what yet, it does tell us that there's something asymmetric in the panel. Obviously the laser pointer isn't getting brighter and dimmer, and the AC waveform is balanced too. So there's something physically in the panel that is asymmetric. So that's kind of interesting. And um, as I mentioned, it is running on AC. Let's take a minute and talk about why you would not want to build a panel that runs on DC. I tried it, by the way. I put, at first, not knowing very much about plasma display panels, I just hooked this up to a DC supply and no light comes out. <laughs> Laser pointer or no, you will not get any light out of this panel or no current will flow when you put DC on it. So let's talk about why you would not build a panel that runs on DC. When I was a kid, I used these neon line testers and thought I understood them well enough. Until one day, I fell for the classic blunder of taking a bare neon bulb and holding it while putting it into a wall socket. Uh, in case you don't know what happens, it explodes. And so, <laughs> luckily I wasn't injured, so this was a teaching moment only and not an injury moment. But it drives home the fact that limiting current is a very important thing in electrical engineering. Um, sometimes there's so much focus on voltage, but it's really current is the thing that kind of ends up mattering in circuits. And so, yes, if you want to power a neon bulb, you must put a current limiting resistor in series with it, or at least uh, limit the current through some other circuit means. Um, similarly, if you have two neon bulbs in parallel, you cannot get away with just putting one current limiting resistor for the both of them because each bulb has different characteristics in how it turns on and conducts current. Once the plasma ignites, the voltage or the resistance goes way down and that bulb will start hogging all the current. So you really need a resistor for every single neon bulb. So if you were to build a plasma display, essentially an array of neon bulbs, you would need to have a current limiting resistor for every single pixel. Now that's not out of the question. It's possible that you could have uh, a resistor built into the pixel. I mean, we, we build active displays that have transistors for every pixel. I mean, that's not out of the question. Although it's not as easy and matching the brightness pixel to pixel is gonna be a challenge. And another big challenge is going to be current limiting. So, or power dissipation for those current limiting resistors. So all these problems put together, I don't think they've ever made a commercial panel that has a resistor for each pixel, but I'd be happy to be proven wrong. But there is another type of panel that does it a different way. Here's a pinball dot matrix display, basically an array of neon bulbs. And you can even see it says, game over, credit zero. And uh, this one does not have a resistor for every neon bulb. And if we turn it over, we can get a better idea of what's going on. We can see that it has, it indeed has lots of resistors to limit the current. These are actually pull down or pull up resistors, not current limiting resistors. And the way they get away with not having a resistor for each pixel is that they only light up one row at a time. So the way this works is you can have one current limiting resistor for each column, as long as you only ever light up one row at a time, which is how this thing works. So it's got high voltage shift registers, 
very similar to the ones that I used in my electroluminescent project. And for some reason, they split the voltage so that this one actually is running at negative 120 volts. And these two are running at plus 60 volts. So it scans through the 32 rows, putting negative 120 on there. And the pull, pull up or pull down resistors just cancels the voltage when it's not having an output. I guess this is not a totem pole driver. It's just an open collector or something. And then uh, when that row is active, it puts that specific row's data on these and puts the 60 volts up here. Okay, so that sounds fine. The only problem with that is that you can only have one row creating light at any given time. So that means that your display is going to be pretty darn dark unless you pump a ton of current through there because each row is only going to be on for a 30 second of the time that you have available. Since you have to scan through these, even if you have them on all the time, like you're, you're constantly scanning through this with as much time as you've got, each row can only be on for one thirty second of that time, which means that each row has to be 32 times brighter than it would normally be if it were on all the time. So these things are overdriven. Like basically each neon bulb has to be 32 times as bright because we've got 32 rows here. So that can work if you only have 32 rows maybe, but if your panel has hundreds or even thousands of rows, that means that each row would have to be hundreds or thousands of times brighter because it can only be illuminated for a tiny fraction of the time available. And it just doesn't work. So the solution is to make an AC panel and it increases the drive complexity quite a bit, but it does solve the problem of needing a resistor at each pixel because on AC, uh, the way the layering is set up, as we'll see, you end up with an impedance for each pixel. So after doing a bunch of research, this is my nearest guess of what the stack up looks like, the cross-sectional view for one of those monochrome AC plasma display panels. So we've got glass on the bottom and then a metal layer, and in that panel the rows are metal. You can see they're either aluminum or chrome or something. Then there's a dielectric, which is an insulator and then a thin layer of magnesium oxide, which is just a protective layer for the dielectric. I spent a long time trying to find out what the dielectric was. I spent hours searching, what is the dielectric layer in an AC plasma panel display? And I realized it's pretty esoteric, but I, I only found out it's probably glass with some special ingredients in it to change the dielectric properties. And perhaps those special ingredients are sensitive to the plasma. So they always add a magnesium oxide layer as a protector to keep the plasma away from the dielectric. I never really got to the total bottom of it, but it's not going to change um, our discussion here. So anyway, so then there's the gas layer, neon and, and helium or neon and argon probably. And then the same thing up here, except the electrode has to be ITO, which is a clear conductive thing. Um, you wouldn't use ITO on the bottom just because it's more expensive and it doesn't have to be clear on the bottom. It only has to be clear on the top. So this works out pretty well. If we put AC between the metal rows on the bottom and the ITO columns on the top, uh, a field will be formed in here and the current doesn't flow through. It's alternating current. So it just pushes the charge back and forth and excites the gas into a plasma and we get a very controlled amount of current through because we can control the frequency and we control the dielectric thickness and the dielectric properties. So we have a really good uh, uniformity across the panel because this dielectric layer can be very uniform. And of course the frequency is the same everywhere and the composition is the same. So every pixel comes out with the same electrical properties and we have really good control over the whole system. So how does the ultraviolet laser fit into all of this? So here's my guess, when the light comes in, it will strike either the metal and or the ITO layer and cause charge to be injected into the dielectric. This is called hot carrier injection in the semiconductor business. And the idea is that if you have a pool of charge down here, which we do because this is a metal, when you hit this with a high enough energy photon, one of those charge carriers will get launched into the dielectric. And if the field happens to be on at that time, the field will drag the charge through the dielectric and into the plasma or into the gas um, creating the plasma, exciting it. So when the field is on, we have this ability to inject charge carriers all the way from the metal into the plasma and getting it to burn brighter. And as we found out, once the plasma gets going, the resistance drops and that causes more current to flow, which is why we get this kind of flip-flop behavior. 
And uh, interestingly, what about the ostinato? Like we, we saw that when it, was, it goes bright dot, dark dot throughout the AC cycle. What about that? My theory for that one is that when we're in the positive half of the cycle, we have holes down here, charge carriers. So when the light comes in, it has to liberate a hole through the photoelectric effect. And when it's in the other half of the cycle, it's electrons down here. And the work function for holes and electrons is different. There's a different threshold. So we'll actually get more, it's more easy to liberate charge during one half of the cycle than the other half. An alternative theory, if that one doesn't turn out to be correct, is that ITO has a different work function than the metal down here. So it's possible that we're getting this same effect up here with the ITO. I think that's less likely because the ITO itself just doesn't absorb as much UV as the metal. And I don't know, I think ITO can participate in photoelectric effect, but not positive. And I'm sure the effect is much larger for a, an opaque piece of metal because all the, electro, or all the photons get stopped by this. So I, I learned a lot myself when researching this thing and didn't realize that you can inject charge into a dielectric and actually expect it to flow across in the right conditions. But it sure seems like that's what's happening here. At the very least, the charge is going from the metal into the dielectric and changing its properties enough such that more current flows through the whole thing. Instead of the charges making it all the way through the dielectric, it's possible they're just getting stuck in there and that changes the capacitor, effective capacitance of this and then more current flows and ignites the plasma to a higher level. But what about when the power is off? I asked if you could think of any devices that can change state even when the power is off. And there it is, it's an EEPROM. In fact, the physics are very similar to what's going on in here. So this device works by storing charge in a insulator layer and it stays there essentially forever and that's how it stores your data. If you don't know how these uh, things work, it's basically a way of um, putting your data into a locked, uh, an isolated conductor which is you know, not connected to anything and it stays there because there's no way for it to get out, right? I mean, it's behind all these insulators. But the way that you erase this device is by shining intense ultraviolet light on it. Even when the power is not connected, you just put it in a, in a device that shines ultraviolet on there. And what that does is it allows the charge to escape its prison of insulative dielectric material uh, through this photoelectric effect, charge carrier injection effect. So it's actually very similar in structure and similar in function. When we shine ultraviolet on there, we can change the state of these pixels at, or state of memory cells. And uh, there you go. The one main difference is that in an EEPROM, there's a gate behind the dielectric. And in this case, it's basically insulator materials all the way up to the plasma, which is kind of a, I don't know if I'd really call that a conductor. And so it's not, there's no floating gate basically in a um, plasma display, which there is in an EEPROM. But there's a lot of interesting parallels here. And I was pretty blown away by how weirdly similar they are in structure and function and everything. It's kind of like a visual EEPROM that you can see on this you know, display. So I mentioned that there's virtually no literature about this effect out in the world, but there's a really funny exception. One day I was at work and I was kind of, you know, bragging about my great discovery here, about how cool this was and everything. And someone said, you know, I patented that idea in 2004. <laughs> so that's the great thing about working with uh, really clever people is that there's no shortage of uh, good ideas and inspiration. And sure enough, the patents are there. Uh, it doesn't talk about any of the AC characteristics or the insulator layers or charge injection, but it was mostly about the photoelectric effect and using a laser to ignite the plasma as a way of addressing a screen like that. So I, I, it is interesting that I tried very hard to search the web, I mean, for a long time about information about this effect and didn't find anything. But knowing the patent number was the key that kind of brought those to light. I also thought quite a bit about color televisions, plasma color televisions, which are actually much more complicated than anything we've talked about in the video so far. They typically have three to four electrodes per subpixel and use addressing and sustaining and ignition electrodes, and it is a very, very complicated drive waveform. Um, there's plenty of patents out there regarding plasma color televisions, but again, it, it's different than what we're showing in this video. It's just more complicated in almost every way. And so part of the reason that, you know, my video output has been lower is because I kind of nerd snipe myself where I think, well, this is so cool, but I could keep going with it. I mean, I should build my own driver circuit or I should get a color plasma TV and see how that works. Or I should build my own single pixel plasma display or play with dielectric layers myself. And there's really just no end to the rabbit hole, which is good because 
we wouldn't want to run out of cool things to discover or think about in the universe. But on the other hand, it's sometimes just time to make a video. And so this time it was time. Anyway, I hope you found that as interesting as I did. It was really quite a journey for me and ended up learning quite a bit along the way. So I hope you found that interesting, and I will see you next time. Bye.